I'm Adam Morris. Um, I'm with my colleague Jason Sabatka. Um, we're both engineers at cesium, and we're both a little bit obsessed with 3D Gaussian splitting, um, which is what we're talking to you about today. So um, well, everything that I'm about to show you right now is available now. You'll see these QR codes. Um, the, this one, and you'll see it again at the end, uh, goes to ION, um, where you can try this out. Um, our 3D Gaussian splatting support is experimental right now. So our, what, what we want to do today is that we want to get this out to you so you can give us early community feedback. Um, it's using a draft proposal extension for G GLTF that my colleague will talk more about in a few minutes. We already have changes in flight to this extension. Um, we're, we're splitting things, things up and, and we're doing things. So we do expect changes and so we make no promises about what, what you know, what the content of those changes will be. What we will say is that, you know, we um, hope that, you know, you'll try this out, you'll give us feedback, because ultimately that feedback is what we need right now to make sure that we get you something that is, you know, going to stand the test of time. Um, so before I go any further, I do want to give you a brief inter introduction into radiance fields. And um, thanks to a fun interoperability thing, your, my video here doesn't work. So... Um, WebN on Mac does not work, so. Um, yeah, so 3D Gaussian splatting is a form of uh, radiance field reconstruction. Um, so radiance fields use neural networks to create volumetric representations of scenes. Um, this is an alternative to photogrammetry to create, which, you know, is used to create reality meshes. Um, you'll often hear us rendering engineers talk about that radiance fields are the wave of the future, and that's because they offer really high fidelity and they can easily capture and represent things like thin structures very easily, where, you know, traditional methods, you, you could spend a lot of time working um, on a thin structure. And for, you know, photogrammetry, as you all know, thin structures often get uh, taken away. So the video that you can't see um, actually shows the neural radiance field, or NERF, which is one of the, the two popular forms. Um, so right now, today, neural radiance fields and 3D Gaussian splattings are the two most popular forms of radiance fields. Um, NERF is what really brought everyone's attention to radiance fields. Um, they use continuous volumetric scene functions, um, and they offer really high fidelity, but it comes at a cost. Um, besides being expensive to generate, NERFs can be expensive to render as well. Um, on the other hand, 3D Gaussian splatting is much more attainable, and it doesn't need an expensive GPU. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk to you more about today. So what is 3D Gaussian splats, or often abbreviated as 3DGS, which you'll see throughout this presentation. Um, 3D Gaussian splatting is an efficient radiance field reconstruction method. Um, rather than using a continuous volumetric scene function like NERFs, um, we use a sparse cloud of volumetric 3D Gaussians to represent splats within a scene. Um, this approach makes splatting faster to both render and train when compared to NERF, but with largely the same fidelity and advantages uh, of other forms of radiance fields. Um, and what we're seeing right now is that 3D Gaussian splatting is really quickly tr starting to change geospatial. And the reason why is because they're allowing us to capture and render things that we've been unable to in the past. Um, a great example is this bridge. So the thin structures of this bridge with traditional photogrammetry methods, I mean, everybody in, a, in this room who's done, dealt with photogrammetry before knows that those are all going to go away. Um, they'll look really bad. They won't work great. Um, 3D Gaussian splatting really excels at, at preserving these. And so in this demo that I have here, you can actually see um, this more clearly. Um, we've got this substation, which you've probably seen in a few other pr presentations. But as I'm swiping back and forth, you can see the difference between the reality mesh and uh, 3D Gaussian splat representation. And so right away, the wires are really visible. When you get to this tower, you can see the tower in really good quality compared to the reality mesh. And also, you know, you're keeping all of these electrical cables that would otherwise be gone. So it also does really great with traditional photogrammetry tasks too, though. Um, we've got a really high capture of a boathouse here. Um, there's lots of well-preserved details. Um, this capture was actually taken by the very teenage, talented teenage son of a colleague of ours at Cesium. Um, she's actually right over there. Um, and I, I want to repeat that. Like, this was taken by a teenager, a talented one at that, but with a limited set of knowledge going into this. 
And so that's another advantage of 3D Gaussian splatting. As long as you have enough source images, there's almost no tweaking required to get a good, reliable output. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this over to my colleague Jason, who's going to walk us through how we render splats in, C in uh, CCMJS using 3D tiles and GLTF. Jason? Thank you, Adam. So beyond just rendering at CCM, we have to think about size. 3D tiles is great for streaming uh, spatially coherent data, but we also want the payload to be small, or as small as possible without losing uh, too much detail or, or uh, fidelity. And with, with splatting, they were, it was released, everyone was using ply files, they're huge, they're, you can't, they don't scale. Um, so when Niantic Spatial came out with their open source SPZ format, we were really excited, we like open source, we like collaboration, so we've been working with them and others. Uh, to bring SPZ into GLTF. Uh, you can follow that QR code, and there's an active discussion going on right now. It's our open uh, issue on GitHub. And uh, yeah, it, it was a, you know, a great opportunity to collaborate it, you know, with an open source um, uh, solution to taking splats and making them smaller and uh, streamable. So SPZ, it's splat zip. They use various quantization techniques to make the data smaller, and then they gzip it. Primarily, it's uh, their handling of spherical harmonic data that really got us excited. Uh, you know, there's been you know mesh op and other compression techniques are good for other data, but they really nailed uh, spherical harmonics. Um, and you don't really lose a lot of uh, detail uh, given the file size. We find it covers most use cases. Most users shouldn't see any major degradation. In this example, you have 1.8 million splats, and it goes from 450 megabytes down to 43 with 3D tiles, GLTF, and SDZ. So as uh, my colleague Adam said, our, our uh, current implementation is in CCMJS. It's very experimental. Um, but it's out there. You can try it. Uh, there's some Sandcastle demos. If you don't have your own data or anything, you can still see something and try it out. Uh, that wiper demo is out there, I think. Uh, one thing to note uh, in this little, or everyone's favorite substation, um, you can see the bounding boxes. There's actually tiles there. You know, we're, we're rendering, we're streaming multiple tiles and rendering, rendering them together. Um, and one of the challenges there is with the sorting and making sure everything is, is uh, correct. Uh, sorting splats is a big challenge on the web. This is a WebGL2 implementation. Um, but again, it's experimental, but we want your feedback. We want to hear what people think about it and what you'd want to see um, in the future. So from a user's data perspective, uh, this is kind of what our pipeline looks like at a high level. Whether you have ply, ply data that you've already trained from another service or your own computer, or you have raw images, you can upload them into ION, we'll, and we'll tile them for you. Or if you're an iTwin Capture customer, you can do the same thing. And they're both using the same back-end cloud services uh, to accomplish this, so the results should be the same. And this is a, a video, just a, a quick demo of uh, how this process works in, in ION, if, if you're familiar with ION or not. Um, but you can go to your assets, and you can add a file, and you just Select your ply file and upload it. It's pretty typical stuff. Uh, yeah. So the really important things to note here is that it's uh, it recognizes as point cloud data, and there's a little Gaussian splats toggle. This UI will probably change, uh, but um, kind of gives you an idea. So once it's uploaded, it'll just tile it like anything else. In this case, it's a ply file, so we're not doing any heavy processing. We're just tiling it like anything else, so it's relatively quick. And then once you have it uploaded, you can then bring it into CCMJS. Here's a simple sandcastle. Um, one thing to note is that when this data was tiled, it is geo-referenced. So it'll appear on the globe in the correct place without having to do like, any manual uh, positioning. So finally, uh, our upcoming work. Um, level of detail support is something we're really heavily focused on. We want to, make the, we want to maximize the use of 3D tiles and LOD is paramount to that. And, and, and simultaneously, we'll continue our work with the, the community on the GLTF specification. Uh, that's a big part of the feedback. We want to we'll make sure that this is a format that's not just good for us, but good for everybody. So we're working with Niantic Spatial, Kronos, and Esri and others uh, to make sure that uh, we accomplish that. And of course, additional client support, uh, like Kevin mentioned, uh, Unreal support, and uh, also you. <laughs>